Okay, we're going to handle uh, part two now and uh, of our series on Paul and John's revelation. And this will ask the question, does Jesus say someone falsely said he is Jesus' apostle at Ephesus? And who, in fact, was this? Just so we have a little bit of a geography uh, lesson here. And uh, you can see it says Asia. That's not in uh, China. That's in uh, uh, modern uh, Western Turkey. And Ephesus was the capital. And uh, you see Patmos. That's where John had been uh, uh, on the island imprisoned. And he was eventually released uh, and went back into Ephesus. But uh, he's actually having his revelation while he's on Patmos. So uh, Ephesus was uh, the headquarters, the capital of the province of Asia, a Roman province along the western coast of modern Turkey near Greece. Uh, to differentiate this Asian Asia from the Far East, it is sometimes called Proconsular Asia. And uh, Ephesus was the leading city as well as capital. Ephesus had a population of 250,000 people. Okay, and we're going to take a look at uh, where Jesus is uh, talking. This is in Revelation 2, verses 1 and 2. We'll just set it up with going back to the very end of Revelation chapter 1, where Jesus is talking. So you can see it's all one stream. Uh, Revelation 1, 18, I was dead, and behold, I am alive. Verse 19, write therefore the things you saw, and the things which are, and the things which shall come to pass. Then it begins in chapter 2. To the angel of, ch of the church in Ephesus, write. So this is Jesus' instruction. Two, I have known thy works and thy labor and thy endurance, and that thou art not able to bear evil ones, and that thou hast tried those saying themselves to be apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. That's the verse we're going to look at today and see uh, who did Jesus have in mind. Now, it's no real secret uh, that uh, Paul's the most obvious person. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul in 2 Timothy tells Timothy that he had a trial that he endured in a Christian congregation. He said he put up his first defense. We'll see that when we get to chapter 4 among them. However, Paul says, all forsook me. He says that not only here, but he says that in, in uh, the fourth chapter of Timothy. Uh, and in an exact parallel, Paul identifies in the same epistle that his trial took place in Asia, where Ephesus is the capital. Paul writes that all uh, to the Christians of Asia, uh, wrote that all the Christians of Asia defect, defected from him. So this is very much fits exactly what Jesus said. Oh, and so the verse says uh, in 2 Timothy 1.15, Paul writes, This thou knowest that all that are in Asia turned away from me, of whom are of Phygelus and Hermogenes. Okay, and uh, now we'll read... 2 Timothy 4, verse 16 to 17. At my first offense, so he's talking like this is a trial, right? No one took my part, but all forsook me. May it not be laid to their account. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Which, by the way, Judah is usually symbolically symbolized by a lion. So this may be you know, hinting that Jewish people were his opponents here, uh, or Christians of a Jewish background. Paul in 2 Corinthians is going to come back to the same issue. He recalls this defection among Christians of Asia. He says it felt like he was under the sentence of death. In, first, in, in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 to 9, Paul writes, quote, For we would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning our affliction which befell us in Asia, that we were weighed down exceedingly beyond our power, insomuch that we despaired even of life. Yea, we ourselves have had the sentence of death within ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Okay, so clearly he's had a, uh, a difficult trial in, in there. Everyone abandoned him. Uh, he felt despaired unto a sentence of death. Now, there's very close association between what he's saying and what happened in Acts chapter 19 with a uh, Jew, what started as a Jewish congregation in Ephesus. And then Paul had a period of time where he's actually... Uh, reasoning with them and persuading them, apparently successfully. So let's read what, uh, but then they turned against him, and it's not clear why exactly. So here is the, uh, it's not explained. So it could be this entire trial. It could be a, a lot of things. Luke doesn't doesn't uh, need to go into all that. Acts 19, verses 1, 8 to 9, it starts, Paul came to Ephesus, and he entered into the synagogue at Ephesus and spake boldly for the space of three months, reasoning and persuading as to the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the multitude, 
he departed from them, i.e. the Ephesians. So somebody stood up and tried to rebut him, and Paul left. He didn't. He, that's how it, it sounds from Luke. But this easily could have been where they did do a trial of him, and this this group was coming along and becoming Christian, and then when he had uh, someone come against him, that led to a problem, and maybe it was the trial. Okay, and Paul said to the Ephesians that God himself appointed him an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is his words in the opening line of Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. From Paul, chosen by God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus to God's people who live in Ephesus and are faithful followers of Jesus Christ. However, we have to go back to what Jesus said in Revelation 2.1. He condemns self-serving statements to be uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Let's read it again. I have known thy works and thy labor, he's telling the Ephesians, and thy endurance, and that thou art not able to bear evil ones, and that thou hast tried those saying themselves to be apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. So self-serving claims doesn't mean you're an apostle. Nobody had to accept it. They can test it and see whether it's possible he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. And now we see if we go to uh, Luke chapter 1, we'll find out that the 11, uh, with the help of Jesus Christ, picked the 12th. This is in Acts 1, 21 to 26. And let me just say this. A lot of Christians, if you ask them who was the 12th apostle, they think it's Paul. And they do not know the story. So there's a lot of illiteracy. So if anyone asks you, try to remember where this is. It's in the first chapter of Acts at the end. Verse 21. Of the men, therefore, that have complained accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and went out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the day that he was received up from us. Of these must one become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they're deciding we have to pick a new person. It has to be someone who has this qualification. They were with us from the beginning, from the baptism of John until the resurrection, uh, the ascension into heaven. Verse 23, and they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias, and they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, who knowest the hearts of all men, show of these two the one whom thou hast chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas fell away, that he might go to his own place. And they gave lots for them, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So uh, a lot was a, actually a biblical way of handling that. You let the Holy Spirit make the decision between two people, and that's how it worked out. And the office of an apostle was intended for eternity. And uh, in, in the New Jerusalem, we're told by John, what's the city look like? And, and this is what he says. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So there's not 13. We already have 12 with Matthias. And that's it. And Paul's out. And in Jesus' earthly ministry, he also said the role of the 12 apostles was to, quote, sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, Matthew 19, 28. Against, again, it's incongruous to have a 13th apostle. So it didn't happen. And also, Alan Johnson uh, will explain, and I'll, I'll tell you who he is in a second. He's going to explain that the office of the apostles died with them. In other words, nobody, there's no history of there ever being an effort to replace any of them. Uh, just because they passed away. Uh, in fact, one dies in the middle of Acts, James, the brother of John, and there's no effort to replace him. So here's what Alan Johnson says. In the Calvin, Calvinist expositor, Expositor's Bible Commentary, he agrees that the early church treated the office of the 12 apostles as dying with them. In this article uh, called Hebrews Revelation in Expositor's Bible, Volume 12, 1981, it says this, as to whether the authoritative function of apostles continued after the first century, the apostolic fathers are instructive. In no case do the many references to apostles in the writings of Clement of Rome, Ignatius, Barnabas, and the Shepherd of Hermas relate to any recognized apostles other than those associated with the New Testament. The fathers apparently understood the special apostolic function on earth to have ceased with the end of the apostolic era. Basically, though, when the 12 died, there was no replacement. So there's, there was no chance for Paul ever to have any, any advancement beyond uh, being whatever he, he was. And Paul had a definite consciousness that he was not one of the 12. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 to 8, that uh, you know after the 12 saw the resurrected, so did he. So here's what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 to 8. And that he appeared, Jesus, to Cephas, which means... Peter, then to the 12, so he's not in that 12, 
and that would have included Matthias, and he's looking, I assume he knows that Matthias was added, and so he's looking backwards, so Matthias was there at the extension, just as the apostle said, they had to be, um, uh, or at the resurrection, they must have been at every stage from baptism all the way to the ascension that they were involved. Anyway, so then to the twelve, and then to prove you, to you that he, he knows he isn't one of the twelve, it goes on. Then he appeared to above 500 brethren at once, and last of all, as to the child untimely born, he appeared to me also. So he knows he's not part of the twelve, and he actually makes that very clear. And also to read the uh, the Gospel of Luke, it's very clear that Paul is never called uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ in the sense of having a office from, from Jesus <laughs> that's never recognized. In fact, in Acts 15, when uh, Peter says, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter, Paul, Paul is silent. And, and he, Paul, Peter says, the Holy Spirit appointed me to do that. And that was in Acts 10. So even the office he claims to be, have was denied him by Luke. It, but that doesn't mean Luke even knew Paul ever said these in his letters. It's just he is completely aced out by Luke on anything. He has no apostleship and he has no apostleship to the Gentiles either. John Cross and Jonathan Reed in 2004 wrote, in all his letters, Paul seems as an apostle, sees himself as an apostle sent from God to Christ. The very voca vocation for which Paul lives is denied him by Luke. He is, to be sure, an important missionary, but he is not an apostle equal to the twelve. Engel and Schwemmer in John Knox Press, Paul between Damascus and Antioch says the very same thing. In Acts, Paul is denied the title of apostle. It never happens. Not, not as a title. Now, for Paul to make this claim, you can't just say, God God told me this. That doesn't make you an apostle. And you shouldn't tell third parties that unless you can prove it through some uh, verification of two witnesses. God speaking from heaven like he did over Jesus, right? And that kind of stuff. And John Baptist. Okay. Jesus says, one needs two witnesses for an important office from God. He says in John 5, 31, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. So if Paul's the only witness of himself, what's the consequence? His witness is not true. What does that mean? He's a liar. That's what the Ephesians found. And if you look again at Jesus' statement in Revelation 2.2, he's cl clearly saying these persons had a self-serving claim, meaning no verification from two witnesses. God from heaven speaking in front of people, nothing like that. Uh, calling him an apostle. And by the way, that never happens in all of Paul's different three different accounts of his uh, encounter with Jesus supposedly in the wilderness, and that's clear. He never, he never ever says that. He says at one point you'll be a martyr, meaning a witness. So here's what uh, Revelation 2:2 2 -2 says again: I know thy works and thy toil and patience, and that thou canst. This is to the Ephesians, not bear evil men, and didst try them that call themselves apostles, and they are not, and didst find them false. So um, that's saying a self-serving statement is not adequate proof. Okay, so we've reached our conclusion, and I'll recap it here. Uh, Paul is the obvious target of Jesus' criticism in 68 AD. Paul's claim in Ephesians 1, 1 to be apostle of Jesus Christ, appointed by God, was completely self-serving and was not true as a matter of God's law, which even Jesus had to pass. That's in John 5:31. 2. Paul was tried in Asia, where Paul says he put on a defense, then everybody in Asia forsook him. Ephesus was the capital of Asia. Paul said it was like a sentence of death. Three, Paul could never be a true apostle as the number was sealed at 12. None were replaced with new apostles ever. Their office ceased upon their passing. Anything else would be incongruous for their role into eternity as the 12 judges of the tribes of Israel. Okay, so I think the case was made so far that Jesus' words were valid. He gave us clear directions. They're warnings to us. He's our Lord and Master. We obey him. If these people in Ephesus were validly concluding that this same person we're all talking about, Paul, was the person in view, and you can judge for yourself, and you can then make a decision in your personal life that the, the person that <laughs> occupies so many epistles in the, in the Bible is not someone Jesus intends for, intends for you to be reading at all. There's, there's so much bad stuff in there uh, that, that you should not allow your mind to be affected by. And I think uh, that's why the Lord did this. And now, what's the purpose of this? Jesus is giving you warnings, is giving you uh, in, in facts that you and I, we can all make a, a, what we call a Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 10 review, which is, did this person, was he a false prophet? You know, so 
uh, if he is, then you just are not supposed to pay attention to him anymore. So that's that's the essence of it. So I hope this helped everybody. Uh, we're going to come back in a third uh, episode in this series, which will be uh, who did Jesus say was the or who was Jesus directing his criticisms about eating, teaching people to eat meat sacrificed to idols? Who could that be uh, in, in the New Testament uh, era? Uh, who's a, a, a leading influence in these Asian churches, these churches, seven churches in Asia. So we'll see. I think you probably can make a guess. God bless. Hope this helps everybody.